All right, hey everybody, this is Captain Morley again, here to talk to you today about fragmentation. Now, disclaimer up front, these are some grossly simplified equations that I'm going to show you today uh, in a really elementary way to sort of think about fragmentation, its flight through the air, and really its effects on targets, all right? So this is not rigorous, um, however, I think it gives a very good idea of the ways to sort of think about these types of problems and it also helps with students to gain a little bit of an intuition on how small changes in variables like the ratio of the metal casing to the amount of explosive in a given warhead how that can dramatically affect the initial conditions of fragmentation and therefore the damage done on the distant end okay and with no further ado, um, this is going to be the first out of two examples. And uh, I thought I'd go ahead and paint the scenario as the following. So let's say we have some sort of a field out in the middle of our, of our battle, battle space. And this field has been converted into an, a runway of sorts, okay? Um, so the enemy is trying to use this as some kind of a, maybe a fueling and replenishment point. Um, but what we have here is we've got, uh, let's say we've got some big armored trucks, right? So we got some armored trucks carrying material and let's say around the trucks, we've got personnel. Some might be, uh, inside the truck and some are around the truck. And then nearby, we also, let's say we have some aircraft. Now, I'm going to butcher this drawing, I'm sure, but let's say there's our wing, there's our, our tail to the aircraft, there's the other wing out the back, the canopy. Okay, good enough, right? So there's our aircraft, and it's also in this field. All right, so we've got essentially parked armored vehicles, a parked plane, and personnel more or less in the open. Now, and the reason I put all three of these targets on here is let's go ahead and assume that we have an incoming missile. We know where they are, and so here comes our missile, right? Again, not the, my best drawing in the world, and it's gonna detonate at this point, okay? And we're gonna make the assumption that the distance to these three types of targets is all, are all equal to each other, all right? And let's call the distance between this for now S, because this is the, the variable that you're gonna see that shows up in the equations. So S, in this case, let's go ahead and say that S is equal to 50 meters, okay? So again, rough generalization, we have a detonation of a warhead. Uh, it's going to be exactly 50 meters away from a person, an armored truck, and an aircraft. What I would like to know is, given the variables I'm about to present, what is the amount of damage that's going to occur at each of these three types of targets given this distance of 50 meters? Okay, well, let's go ahead and uh, let's start with introducing the three different equations and then we'll come back and I'm going to fill out some of the uh, required constants and variables that you need here. So the first equation that we're going to consider is, well, what is the kinetic energy or the, the really the damage threshold, all right, how much energy or damage potential uh, is going to exist? And that's simply a, an equation you remember from your physics class which is gonna be that kinetic energy, or the energy of, say, a moving projectile, in this case, a fragment, is equal to one-half times the mass of that fragment times its speed at impact, okay? So the speed, or the velocity at which it has at this distance, s. So we give this a sub s because this corresponds to this distance here, capital S. I know it's kinda of hard to differentiate. In this case, this is a capital S for me. I know that there's no reason you would know that right now, but it is. And here's your subscript S. Okay, so that's equation one. What's equation two? Well, in order to get a final velocity, we're gonna need to know the initial velocity V naught, okay? How quick is that little fragment going to be flying outward, okay? Now, V naught is going to be equal to a constant that's called the Gurney constant, okay? Now, this whole thing here is the Gurney constant. So you're not going to look up a value for E and then plug it in. Delta here doesn't necessarily signify a change at this point. This is a generic constant. You could take this whole thing and just give it the value X if you wanted. But it's gonna be the Gurney constant times the square root 
of C over M divided by one plus K over C over M. Now C in this case is going to be the weight of our charge in kilograms and M is gonna be equal to essentially our metal casing, right? Uh, and also in kilograms. So this is really the ratio of how much stuff are we looking to throw around versus how much uh, explosive are we going to use to throw that metal around. And K is going to be essentially a shape constant, okay? So depending on how the warhead is designed, be it a mine, a grenade, a bomb, uh, those sh generic shapes where like a mine would be a flat sheet of explosive to metal, uh, think of a big uh, low cylinder versus a bomb, which is a very long cylinder, or a grenade, which is pretty much a sphere, you're gonna get a K value. So this is gonna be the shape constant. Okay, and, and that's going to go ahead and provide for us in meters per second our initial velocity, which is what we're looking for in that case. But now final step is in order to get from an initial velocity to a final, we have to be able to figure out deceleration of our fragment as it travels to the target. And this is also another pretty straightforward equation where our final velocity is going to equal our initial velocity times e to the negative, and then a whole bunch of constants, rho times c times d times a times s divided by two times m sub s, f. Now, holy cow, what do we got going on here? There's several new um, variables that I discussed in the Panopto video, but I wanna review them here. Rho in this case is simply gonna be the density of our air, okay? Uh, this is normally a constant for all intents and purposes. However, in real world applications, the, yeah, this absolutely is a bit of a variable. If we're operating in the Persian Gulf, that's gonna be very, very different than if we're operating in the Arctic, right? You just, the air isn't necessarily homogenous throughout the entire Earth. Uh, but as, as a general rule, we're gonna keep the density of air roughly 1.2 to 1.3 kilograms per meters cubed in almost all scenarios. Now, C sub D is a drag coefficient. So when the fragments are made here off the casing of this missile, they're going to hopefully be a similar size and shape. Now, these shapes matter significantly because the shape is going to decide how well the fragment flies through the air, right? Drag coefficients. You want this number to be as low as possible. A low drag coefficient would correspond to a very aerodynamic shape, okay? So you're going to have a drag coefficient. Uh, next, you're going to have A, which is simply the surface area of your fragment, right? Uh, area. Where when you really combine these three variables, the, the density of the air, the air that's being dragged, right? So the drag coefficient, and then finally the, the amount of this, of this surface that's av available, um, all three of these really pull together to create your generic concept of drag through the air, all right? Um, so the larger any of these get, uh, the more we are going to decelerate this round. That's why all three of them are found in the numerator here. By increasing the numerator, we are hurrying the deceleration. I know there's a whole lot of negatives and positives work in, worked into that one. But if you look at the math, it's going to make some sense for you. All right, S is, of course, the distance traveled, which I already introduced. Distance traveled. And then M sub F is the mass of our fragment, and that's an average mass. Okay, and that's pretty much everything. So we're going to need to know V-naught. Um, that'll be plugged in right here. That's essentially our initial condition, and then we're going to decelerate. Now remember, just generically speaking, what does exponential decay look like? Well, you're starting at some level. For us, it would be V naught, and then we are going to decelerate, okay, over distance. Um, now, this the slope of this curve here is going to be dependent on all of these variables above. And that's why I mentioned by changing things like rho, C, D, and A, and F for that matter, 
uh, you're going to change this slope and therefore after a certain distance, and I, I shouldn't write this as x, I should write this as s, you can see what your velocity, vs, may be at various distances away. Okay, so that's a, a really rough sketch to give you an idea of, of what some of these variables mean. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and give you some numbers and let's jump into this problem. Now again, we have three different targets, all at a range of 50 meters. So let's go ahead and take a look at, hey, uh, if we put some numbers to this, what would we expect or what can we start to think about when we, when we know that we're talking about targeting personnel versus aircraft versus these trucks? Well, let's say that our, our missile has a charge of 25 kilograms of uh, cyclotol. Now you might wonder why the hell do I care what explosive it is? You'll see in a second. Uh, let's say the metal casing associated with the bomb is 15 kilograms, okay? And because it's a bomb, it's got a rough cylindrical shape and that's the way the, the warhead is designed. And so our K constant, if you look at your chart on page 15, near the top on the right-hand side, you'll see that cylinders or bombs have a K constant equal to 0 0.5, all right? Now, because I told you this is cyclotol, we can also look up our Gurney constant, all right? The square root of two times delta E. And again, we're treating this whole thing as one variable, which you'll see at the bottom right of, uh, page 15. If you look up cyclotol, you'll see it's a combination of RDX and TNT. It's what we would refer to as a pressed explosive. Okay, it has to do with um, how the exp explosive is manufactured and therefore used in various uh, warheads. And it's equal to 200, uh, excuse me, 2,362 meters per second. All right. Uh, so here we go, we've got those variables set. Now let's go ahead and talk about some of these environmental conditions here and some of the characteristics of the frag. Let's say our fragments have an average size of 40 grams. Okay, now you're gonna wanna be careful up front and immediately convert that over to kilograms because kilograms is the unit uh, required for input into these equations. And that's pretty, I mean, that's pretty average size. You know, you're looking about a frag, I don't know, about yay big. Yeah, similar to a bullet, to be honest with you. Uh, let's say we have an air density equal to 1.1 kilograms per meters cubed. So, let, you know, we're probably in like an arid type of a condition here. Air's a little bit thinner, um, and so therefore it's going to decelerate the round a little less. Uh, maybe the humidity is really low. Our drag coefficient is equal to also, let's set it to 1.1, which is roughly cubic, okay? So it's not a perfect cube, but it's gonna be some kind of jagged cube, right? Which is about what we would expect with a frag that would be made in this situ situation. Uh, the surface area, therefore, let's say it's roughly about 4.5. Um, now, I I'm gonna go ahead and say centimeters squared because the way to sort of think about this is if a single die, all six sides of the die are equal to roughly six centimeters squared, because if you think about it, each length of the cube is, and I should have grabbed a die for this video. I don't see one around me right now. Uh, the length of each side is roughly a centimeter, and so you can do the math quite easily. What's the surface of one square? Well, it's one square centimeter, and then there's six of those sides, right? Well, because we're not gonna make perfect cubes, um, it's pretty fair estimate to say that this air surface area will be about 4.5 centimeters squared, which again, when you convert that into meters squared, which you need to do, you end up with 0 0.00045, okay, meters squared. Or you could write that as 4.5 times 10 to the minus four meters squared, all right? And finally, just for the sake of uh, having all our variables in one place, we know that our distance traveled is 50 meters, all right? And with that, we can go ahead and jump right into solving some of these equations. Let's begin here at the bottom of my page before I flip over with V naught, okay? Now V naught, because ultimately, time out, let's take a quick pause and ask ourselves again, what are we solving for with this scenario? What am I fundamentally asking? Well, I'm asking for damage. I want to know how much damage is going to be experienced at, at, at each three of these targets. And to understand damage, if I look here at my chart, 
To understand damage, I have to know the energy that is going to impact each of these types. Once I know the energy level, I'll be able to classify it into either light, moderate, or damage for our three types of targets, all right? Personnel, aircraft, or armored vehicles. So that means ultimately I wanna solve for this equation, kinetic energy. So to get this, I already know the mass of, average mass of my fragment, uh, and I can solve for V sub S, but to solve for this, I need V naught. And that's why we're starting off with V naught, okay? Uh, so we're gonna pull our Gurney constant, 2,362 times the square root of C, 25, over M, 15, divided by, once again, 1 plus K times C over M, all right? And that's it, all right? That's all we gotta do for V naught. You jam that into your calculator, uh, you're gonna end up with 2,252.1 meters per second. So this guy is cooking. This fragment is beginning its initial condition, right? So its starting velocity is 2,000. It's, it's a little over two kilometers per second, all right? So it is flying. So we're gonna keep track of that number. And I'm going to go ahead and pull up the next page here so we can, you know, not have to write down here at the very bottom. And so I'll, I'll jot that down. We, we just solved for V naught. It's equal to 2,252.1 meters per second. All right, and we're off. Now we know ultimately we need to get V sub S. We have V naught, so we can jump right into solving that. Where V S is going to be equal to V naught times e to the minus rho cd a s over 2 m f. Okay, um, v s is equal to 2,252.1 times e to the negative 1.1 times 1.1 times, what did we have here for our a? 4.5 e to the minus 4 times our s, which is 50. All that divided by 2 times. And our mass of our frag was 0 0.04. Okay, so again, take a pause if you're watching this video and you're doing this for the first time. And remember where each of these values are coming from, why they are in the units that they are in, and how they all fit here into this exponent. All right? Uh, so, I mean, this is really just calculator work at this point. Uh, once you do that and solve it out, you're gonna get a final velocity or a, a velocity at distance S equal to 1602.5 meters per second. So this is still cooking, all right? This is moving very, very rapidly. It's a relatively small frag, but it has a huge uh, uh, amount of velocity here. All right, so we're gonna save this value and we're gonna plug it in now to our final step, kinetic energy. We're gonna say the kinetic energy is equal to one half times the mass of the fragment, 0.04, times its velocity, 1602.5 squared. And when we plug that together, we're gonna to end up with a kinetic energy equal to uh, 5,000 uh, excuse me, 51.4 kilojoules, okay, which is massive. That's a huge amount of energy. You might remember from my previous lectures, it really only takes about 80 joules of energy to, uh, to kill somebody, all right? That's obviously an outrageously high or higher level of energy that we have here as a result of this, okay? Um, but is that going to work just as well against the aircraft and the armored vehicle? Well, that's what we want to look at. So let's look at our chart here. Now, off to the side, you can see, if I can keep it all on camera, we have 51.4 kilojoules. Let's just go ahead and say 50 for our purposes looking here at this chart. Now, heavy damage for a person is listed at 4 kilojoules. So 50, obviously much greater than that. For personnel, we can experience, given our scenario of this field where we have all of these targets available, that any person in that, in that vicinity inside the, uh, the fragmentation spray radius is 100% going to receive heavy damage and pass. 
for aircraft, heavy damage occurs at 20 kilojoules. Well, once again, 50 kilojoules is far above that threshold, so heavy damage will be done to the aircraft in the field as well. But when we think about the armored vehicle and the equipment or personnel inside, um, it requires 500 kilojoules just for moderate damage and 1,000 kilojoules or one megajoule in order to get heavy damage. So we are right in between, a little bit closer to the light damage than the moderate. Um, so we're in between these two thresholds. So how would we classify it for the armored vehicle? Well, we would say light damage. We've achieved the 10 kilojoules, but we have not achieved the 500. So our 51.2 kilojoules of damage uh, for personnel, we would say light damage. Oh, excuse me. What am I doing here? Heavy damage. For our aircraft, also heavy damage. And for our armored vehicle, I'm just going to write armor, we're going to have light damage. Okay? And again, this is a, a very, very rough estimation uh, in the real world. The mathematics that go behind some of this are quite elaborate and very extensive, something that has been thoroughly studied now for many, many decades and very well recorded in, in various journals and whatnot. But this gives you a good idea of how you can set up a uh, simple problem like this and think about how damage is going to affect different things in different ways. Uh, given the same fragment with the same initial conditions, we're going to have different effects on our target, which is not only intuitive, uh, but it's also relatively simple when you think about these three equations, okay? So thank you for watching this video. I'm going to go ahead and post another one here shortly that looks at a few different aspects of this type of problem and really other ways that we can use these equations to maybe solve for a different variable, all right? Uh, things that might be a little bit more useful to planners than potentially just looking at damage potential for things, okay? Uh, so thank you, and I will see you all later.